I wanted to start off with my overall impression of the book was that you argue that human behavior, and in particular sort of sophisticated, unconscious human behavior, drives much of our overeating and obesity. Would you agree with that kind of overall impression of the book, or is it just simply a byproduct of writing a book that hope focuses on the overlap between neuroscience and obesity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's really the main point of the book, is that we have these non-conscious systems in our brains that evolve to guide our behavior in a direction that was healthy for our ancestors, but today they're operating in ways that are not healthy for us because our food environment has changed. And, um, you know, we, I think, you know, it's, it's not necessarily intuitive for us to realize that much of our behavior is guided by non-conscious parts of our brain because those parts of our brain we don't have conscious access to by definition, right? And so we're not necessarily aware of how those things are, are operating and yet they're having very uh, profound impacts on our behavior. Just to give you a couple of examples, you know, nobody chooses to experience a craving, a food craving. Where does that come from? Food craving is a food specific motivational state. So why does your brain engage that motivational state to drive you toward the consumption of a particular food? You know, that's not something that we have conscious control over. It's something that uh, arises from your non-conscious brain and that we then experience and, you know, have to manage. Same with hunger. You know, hunger is not something that we choose to experience. You don't say, hey, uh, it's about six o'clock, about time to feel hungry, so I'm going to start feeling hungry now. That is something that emerges from non-conscious systems in your brain and you experience it and then at that point you can, you know, choose what behavior you want to engage. But um, so there's a lot of systems like this. That's just two examples. There's a lot of things like this that are humming away in the background that we're not really that aware of but that are having a profound influence on our eating behavior. And many of those systems in the current context of our food environment are pushing us to overeat. So one of the impressions I again got from your book as compared to let's say other books about nutrition and diet is that a lot of books and diet focus a lot on the food itself meaning that you know if you eat a paleo diet or a vegetarian diet or something like that 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 will kind of overcome this law of how many calories you eat versus how many that you actually gain and you really take some time to kind of defend the calorie in calorie out model in the book and it seems to me that the weight is much more on not so much the food intrinsically being something that causes you to gain weight or not, but that it's your behavioral reaction to that food, that you eat a lot more of the food that you shouldn't eat, or you eat uh, in a sort of way that causes you to gain weight, but the food itself is, is sort of the more neutral actor in your book. Is that sort of a fair impression, or what would you use to clarify that? Well, um, so... I, I would, I'm not sure I would put it quite like that, but um, so let me start from the studies that have been done comparing the um, effects of different diets on body fatness. There have been a number of different studies and, you know, we haven't tested every variable, but we've tested extensively the carb versus fat thing, for example, and even the protein versus other nutrients. And basically, when you control for calories, it doesn't really matter what your macronutrient composition is. If you're really doing it under strict laboratory conditions where you're really controlling everything, um, it matters very little whether your calories are coming from carbohydrate or fat, how much um, your body fat is changing. Really, that's determined by the calories, the overall calorie content of your diet. So it's, um, it's basically a myth that um, certain types of diets can have this special me metabolic effect that you know causes you to burn fat without reducing your calories. It, it's it's not completely a myth. I mean, there's a grain of truth to it. There's prob there probably are small effects of um, different diet compositions, but they're very minor compared to the effect of calories. I mean, calories is really the dominant factor, dominant variable in food that affects your body fatness, and so. Once you come to that understanding, and this, this is very well supported. I know this is controversial. It really shouldn't be. There was a, there was a meta-analysis that came out of 28 studies that compared the carbohydrate to fat ratio in the diet while controlling for calories. 
and they found that it had very little effect. Over 28 different studies uh, that have tested this in controlled conditions, and so this is re it really should not be that controversial. Um, but once we come to that understanding, then the question is, why do we overconsume calories? And that's what my book's all about. Why do we overconsume calories? And the truth is that this is where macronutrient composition actually starts to matter because you actually, you know, depending on the amount of fat and carbohydrate and protein in your diet, that will actually change the amount of calories that you will spontaneously eat. In other words, if you're not trying to do portion control, if you're just eating to fullness, you will likely eat different amounts if you have, you'll likely eat less if you're on a high protein diet you'll likely eat less if you're on a very high um, fat, very low carbohydrate diet. You'll likely eat less if you're on a very low fat, very high carbohydrate diet. And so it does. it's not that macronutrient composition doesn't matter. It's that the effect of macronutrient composition seems to be primarily mediated by the fact that it changes your spontaneous calorie intake. And so basically, why is that? Why do we eat more or less on diets of different composition. And it's not just macronutrients. There are many features of the diet that can cause you to eat more or fewer calories. And so why is that? Well, it comes back down to these brain systems. Basically, your brain you know, pushes you to eat more or fewer calories depending on the type of food that's in front of you. And so I think that's really the key thing we need to understand. I think the more we focus on like what's going on metabolically in the body and the more that we focus on what's going on physio physiologically in the body, the less we're going to understand about what determines body fatness. Because body fatness is all about the brain. It's not about metabolism. It's not about physiology. At least, I don't want to say those don't matter at all, but those are not the central issue. The central issue is behavior, and that is generated by the brain. And so... Um, yeah, so anyway, so, so I want to clarify that the diet composition does matter. Diet composition determines our motivational responses to food, which affects how much of it we eat. For example, you know, a bowl of ice cream is a lot more motivating to eat than a plain celery stick or plain lentils or something like that. And that is because of the different physical and chemical properties of those two foods. We can talk about that. Um, and then, of course, there's the macronutrient stuff I just talked about, like high-protein diets generally make you spontaneously eat less. So the composition of the diet does matter, but in large part, it matters because it changes the number of calories that you consume because it changes the calculus in your brain and changes your eating behavior. So one of the things that kind of follows into that is you talk a lot about food reward. Um, I think there was a couple things there. I don't know whether they're all lumped in the same category, but sort of the deliciousness of food, the variety of food available, um, the kind of calorie density of food, these kinds of things have a have a strong impact on the amount that you spontaneously consume. And so I guess that goes to my, my, my point earlier that, you know, the way I read a lot of books is that the food itself intrinsically is sort of, you know, just eating that food is the thing that's going to make the difference. Whereas you're sort of arguing that it has to go through this layer of behavior first, that eating the food causes you to change your consumption patterns, which themselves are the thing creating the effect. So one of the things about this food reward, which I mean, reading the book, uh, I felt a little bit of pang of kind of uh, disappointment just because it, it sort of undermines this idea that, well, we can have everything we want to eat. It can be a very delicious diet that we're having and, and yet we'll just magically melt off the weight. Whereas you sort of <laughs> presented that it's the deliciousness of food maybe itself that is part of the problem that our behavioral response to delicious food, to ver variety of food, to the things that we like to eat is itself kind of directly the problem. What would you say about that? Do you think that they're, they're kind of matched up in that way or is there, a, is there a difference between the kind of things that drive overeating and the kind of enjoyment of food itself? Yeah, I think there's a lot of overlap between the things that drive overeating and the things that we enjoy. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the case. Um, you know, and the reason is that, and, and by the way, I'll just say right off the bat that I don't think there's a perfect overlap. I think there are, thi there are things you can do to food that aren't necessarily going to make it more fattening and might make it taste better, um, like maybe certain herbs and spices. 
but um, even those might tend to make people eat more of the food uh, because the truth is that if you look in controlled studies, it, the more delicious you make a food, even if you don't change anything about that food that's nutritionally relevant, people will eat more of it. So if you put artificial sweeteners in to make it sweet, or if you put you know certain herbs and spices that people love, they will eat more of it. But um, really, those kind of flavorings like that are, are not the main problem. The main problem is that our brains are hardwired to enjoy foods that contain a lot of calories. And so if we go back to hunter-gatherer days, what you see is that the, um, our ancestors had to put a lot of work into getting calories to survive. And you see this in modern-day hunter-gatherers. Anthropologists have done tons of research on this. Um, basically, their foraging lives are focused around getting the energy they need, the calories they need to sustain their bodies, to you know, fuel their metabolism, to fuel their physical activity, to make babies, to nurse babies. Those are all very energetically demanding things. And so the motivational systems in our brain, these non-conscious motivational systems that make us have cravings and hungers and direct our effort towards certain types of food, those things are geared toward orienting us and motivating us toward high calorie foods. And so, you know, it's not just based on an evolutionary argument. We can actually look at how the body is constructed and we can see that there are hardwired pathways in the body that cause certain nutrients to release dopamine in our brain. And dopamine is this thing that creates uh, these cravings and these motivations for, for us to consume these foods. So when you eat foods um, that contain carbohydrate or fat or protein or salt or glutamate, which is that umami, MSG, bone broth flavor, um, that meaty flavor, those things activate receptors in your gut, and those receptors send signals via your vagus nerve to your brain that release dopamine. This is the same, you know, this is the same mechanism that makes us become addicted to addictive drugs. Um, of course, it didn't evolve to make us addicted to drugs it evolved to make us seek things that were good for us like food that has lots of calories and sex and water and shelter and comfort etc that's what that system evolved for um and so basically you have um these motivational systems that where your motivations your cravings and your pleasure correspond with these food qualities that would have kept our ancestors alive, right? We are motivated to seek the things that in an evolutionary context would have helped our ancestors if we ate those things. And so unfortunately, we're in a different context today where we're drowning in food. We are able to concentrate these properties that spike dopamine more than we ever have in history. We can refine flour, we can refine sugar, we can refine fats, we can refine salt, we can refine glutamate into MSG, and we can combine these things into delicious calorie-dense combinations that then spike too much dopamine in our brains and make us too motivated, trigger too much of a craving. But um, that same, you know, those same properties that we love are the very ones that we're getting too much of in today's world and the very ones that are driving us toward obesity. So, you know, if you just let someone eat whatever they want according to their own preferences with no consideration of health consequences, let's say you're just eating only your most delicious favorite foods, for most people that's going to be an extremely junky, fattening diet. If you're me, you're going to be eating, you know, pizza and ice cream and uh, you know, chocolate all day. And, um, you know, so people don't like have cravings for eating handfuls of raw kale, even though that's a very nutritious, healthy food. That's not what the motivational systems in the brain were designed for. They were designed for those easy to digest calorie bombs. That is what our ancestors were always looking for. Um, yeah. So, I think that the pleasure itself is part of the problem, but I think that there, 
you know, there are different ways to gain pleasure from food. So anything that increases the calorie density of the food is obviously going to be something that your brain is really attuned to and makes it more delicious. So adding more fat, adding more sugar, those types of things, the brain is like, yeah, let's, let's definitely do that. But that's the kind of thing where maybe you want to be cautious about it. Whereas other ways that are not increasing the calorie density of the food, you know, like putting herbs and spices in, um, or maybe more aesthetic things like, you know, the appearance of it, you have, you know, kale and carrots in there and it's a nice color contrast, or you arranged it on your plate somehow, or you made a show of it. Those are things that, yeah, you might eat a little bit more, but it's not going to be as bad as if you're just like throwing some slices of pizza on your plate. So one of the things that you talk about as well is the mechanisms that are in the brain about maintaining fat on the body. In particular, you talk about this lipostat or kind of like a thermostat for your body fatness, where if you go below a certain amount, you get this sort of starvation response and you decide to start eating a lot more. Now, I'm curious about this because it seems to suggest that on top of this additional problem of the fact that deliciousness of food is is a big driver of what causes us to overeat and that as our food has become easier to access and and more triggering in terms of higher calorie and stuff we're eating more of it there's also a tendency that once we become a bit overweight once we become obese that it becomes harder and harder to sort of reverse that process because there's sort of a, a kind of momentum to your body wanting to stay at that weight. So if you try to eat an, a healthier diet, it's a lot harder. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how you think that someone who is trying to stay slim versus someone who's trying to actively lose weight, how it would change their sort of going about that process. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to explain a little bit about this lipostat first, just to orient people. Um, I think this is one of the more important things, probably one of the most important things that I wrote about in my book because um, I think most people in the general public still do not know that there is actually a system in the body that actively regulates the amount of fat that's on your body. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the popular health and nutrition community who, you know, have their ideas about what determines body fatness and this particular idea doesn't get a lot of traction even though this is literally the only known system in the human body that regulates body fatness this is the only system that we know of currently that actually regulates body fatness and uh, the system is housed in the brain in a part of a brain called the hypothalamus the brain specializes, of course, in information processing, and the hypothalamus particularly specializes in information processing that stabilizes physiological functions in the body. The term for that is homeostasis. So the hypothalamus regulates your body temperature, um, it regulates your blood pressure, it regulates uh, the levels of certain ions in your blood, and another thing that it regulates is your body fatness. And um, the way it does that, so is a fairly analogous to a home thermostat. So in your thermostat, you have a thermometer. That thermometer reads the temperature in your home. And then if that temperature begins to drop, the um, thermostat detects it and it kicks in a response to bring the temperature back up, right? So this is called a negative feedback system. So once the temperature starts to deviate from the set point, that you entered in your thermostat, let's say it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, once it starts to deviate, the thermostat kicks on the heat to bring it back up to 70. So that's called a negative feedback system. It's a really common engineering concept, and there's a lot of negative feedback systems in the human body. And so similarly, in your brain, Instead of using, you know, measuring temperature with a thermometer, it measures your body fatness using a hormone called leptin. So leptin is secreted by fat tissue in proportion to the size of fat tissue stores. So the more fat you have on your body, the more leptin is secreted. And your brain is constantly measuring how much leptin there is in the blood to inform itself of how much body fat you're carrying. And the brain has a kind of set point just like your thermostat has a set point, the brain has a set point of the amount of fat that it 
quote, wants you to be carrying. And of course, this is all non-conscious. It's not like people are like, hey, I, you know, I consciously want to be carrying tons of body fat. This is all totally non-conscious, just like your, you know, digestive functions are regulated non-consciously. This is not something we have any control over directly. Um, and, and then what happens is if your body fat starts to drop, your leptin levels drop, your brain senses that decline in leptin levels, and it engages a compensatory response, just like your thermostat kicks on the heat. Well, your brain kicks on a coordinated series of responses designed to bring that fat back. So you get more hungry. You um, start to experience stronger cravings for calorie-dense foods. Your attention gets drawn to calorie-dense foods more easily. Your brain's attention kind of gets directed toward those things. And your metabolic rate slows. So the number of calories that you burn per body weight goes down. And maybe you'll start to feel a bit cold or sluggish if you lose a lot of weight. So those are all things that are designed to get more energy into your body and reduce the amount of energy that is leaving your body. And so that continues until the fat comes back. Um, and that's basically, that's basically how it works. And so a person, this, this system is the reason why weight loss is so hard. It's th the main reason. There's also other issues. But this is the main reason why weight loss is so hard is because once you start, once your body fat starts dropping and it goes below your set point, your brain activates this starvation response. And that is literally what it is. It is a starvation response. It's the same thing you see in people who are actually starving. Um, but it will kick in even if you still have a lot of fat on your body once that level of fat goes below the amount that your brain wants to be carrying according to its set point. And so, um, and so if you're someone who has obesity and you lose weight and now you're, you're just overweight, you're going to have a much harder time maintaining that lower level of body fatness than someone who started off overweight and is just trying to maintain that. So those are two totally different situations from the point of view of your brain. And the difference is that one person is below their set point, one person is at their set point. So how does your set point change? Because we've always sort of talked about how if you kind of your body gets used to having a lot of fat on it and then it you lose it sort of suddenly that this shock creates a starvation response uh is there a compensatory mechanism in the opposite that if you sort of keep weight off for a certain amount of time your your set point will readjust or like uh, how does it uh, you know if someone is in this situation where they are trying to lose weight and keep it off uh from that point of view what what does the science say about how that should be done yeah, so it at first blush, it sounds pretty hopeless, right? It's <laughs> like you're never going to be able to lose weight and maintain it. Obviously, some people do lose weight and maintain it, um, although, frankly, that's the minority. Um, and I think that, so there are a couple different ways to approach it. One is you could ask the question, hey, you know, if I can maintain this weight loss for long enough, will it kind of become permanent? Will that become my new set point? As far as we know, the answer to that is no. Time does not appear to be a factor, unfortunately. However, that does not mean that the set point is immutable. So there are things that are either known or suspected to change the set point. And obviously, people's set point can increase over the course of their lives, right? Because people go from being lean to having obesity. And, you know, when they were lean, their body was defending a lean level of body fatness and now that they're they have obesity their body is defending a lot more body fat so obviously it's possible to change in that direction um, and that is what most people do over the course of their lives but it's also possible to change in the other direction and basically um, there are a few things that you can do to make that happen so um, one of them that I think is just kind of simple that people are familiar with is eating a higher protein, lower carbohydrate diet. So um, when you do that, what you see is that people's calorie intake spontaneously declines. So they, they're eating to fullness, but they're just eating fewer calories at a meal. They're losing fat without feeling like they're having to use portion control, um, even though their calorie intake is dropping, but they're not 
having to enforce that on themselves. Um, and also you see that it kind of um, attenuates the degree to which their metabolism slows. So the metabolic rate doesn't drop quite as much when you lose weight using that method. And um, that seems to be true for other diets as well. So if you uh, go on a very low fat, high carbohydrate diet, you see something very, fairly similar to that. Um, and if you eat a diet that is just kind of bland and boring or simple, as I like to call it, um, just you know, very simply cooked foods on your plate, it has a similar effect. And so the food reward system and the uh, energy regulation system in your body have extensive, extensive interconnections in the brain and seem to influence one another. So, for example, um, if you're really hungry, food tastes better, right? There's that saying, hunger is the best sauce. So that is your energy regulation system influencing your food reward system, the one that generates your cravings and motivations. But it goes the other way, too. If you eat food that's you know, really, really delicious and calorie-dense, that affects your energy regulation system to kind of increase your set point. But you can also reduce your set point by eating simpler, more unrefined foods. And so um, this is what you typically see when you have people who start on an unrefined, simpler diet, just a generally, you know, healthier diet that's lower in junk food, lower in refined foods, lower in sugars and added fats, higher in fiber, lower in calorie density. You see that people's spontaneous calorie intake just declines. And so um, that's one way you can do it through the food. And there are various things you can do there. And then another way is through physical activity. So if you regularly do physical activity, that can help your set point decline. So it can help you feel more comfortable on a lower calorie intake relative to your calorie needs. Um, but there are also some other things like stress management and sleep. And I won't get into those unless uh, you want to talk about those specifically, but those also plug into some of the same systems. And so the, the general idea here is, I th my view, I mean, you can, you can just do portion control and lose weight. You know, if you can actually stick to the reduced calorie intake, you will lose body fat. The problem is that it's difficult. You're going to be fighting yourself the entire time. If you're continuing to eat the same types of foods that you were before, let's say you were eating, you know, calorie-dense foods like fried chicken, fast food, uh, cakes and sweets and drinking soda, you can just eat less of those things and you will lose weight. But it's just more difficult to sustain that because you're having to use your willpower to literally fight yourself every day. You're having to fight the hunger and fight the cravings and fight all these non-conscious mechanisms that are trying to get that weight back. So it's basically your conscious mind against your non-conscious brain. And so I prefer the alternative approach, which is to try to target the non-conscious mechanisms directly so that you feel more comfortable at a lower weight and you naturally gravitate toward the lower calorie intake and the lower body weight. That's my preferred approach because I think it's easier. So it, the kind of uh, takeaway from this, especially since uh, you mentioned that the set point kind of, it goes up more easily than it goes back down, uh, is that we should at least strive like the, the moment where you're going to be most effective in staying healthy your whole life is when you are not overweight or obese to begin with that if you are trying to prevent gaining extra weight so let's just say i'm in that situation uh where i would like to just stay at the kind of healthy weight or you know not at least too fat weight that i, I am at the moment what would be the way of doing this because i think again part of the challenge is just that for a lot of us, this thing happens over a very long period of time. So it's not something that, you know, you're you're just suddenly gained 50 pounds. It might happen over years or decades. Um, what would you recommend as kind of like the approach to follow? Because it just seems to be a natural tendency, maybe either in our environment or with aging to just get a bit fatter every year until, oh, now you're quite a bit overweight and you'd like to change it. But of course, now it's hard because your body's defending that set point. That's right. And, you know, I want to just point out that 
body fat gain with age is not necessarily the human norm. You can find many traditional cultures where body fat stays the same or actually declines as people age on, on a population level. And so um, I think that is a characteristic of modern affluent societies such as our own where everything around us is pushing us to gain weight for our entire lives. Eventually, <laughs> that environment wins. Um, but if you're not in that environment, that, that's not at all how it has to be. So I don't think that's at all a characteristic of normal human aging. I think that's a characteristic of humans in our unhealthy environment. Um, and, and by the way, just to clarify, only some things about our environment are unhealthy. Obviously, we have some awesome things like vaccines and, <laughs> and antibiotics and, you know, sanitation. But in terms of like body fatness and, and you know, cardiovascular health and metabolic health, that's where we're lagging behind. Um, and so I think that um, basically you want to follow a multi-pronged approach and probably the most important prong is focusing on food. So trying to eat a lower calorie density diet that's composed of unrefined foods and having a going hand in hand in that is having a clean food environment. So creating an environment around yourself at home and at work that favors the consumption of foods that support your goal and disfavors the consumption of foods that don't support your goal. So, you know, the kind of, you know, a classic example would be like pizza in the break room at your office or donuts at the meeting. A little basket of in your office. Yeah, th that's like a toxic food environment. Those are things that will trigger your cravings because cravings are triggered by sensory cues like seeing something or smelling something. Um, those are things that will trigger your cravings, will trigger your motivation, and then will get you to eat those foods. And those types of foods, by virtue of their physical and chemical properties, don't create much satiety per calorie. So it takes a lot more calories. You can eat a lot of calories of donuts and not feel very full, whereas if you had eaten oatmeal, the same number of calories you would be exploding. Um, and so the, so yeah, eating simple, unrefined food Controlling your food environment goes hand in hand with that and is very, very important. Not just, you know, getting rid of the unhealthy calorie dense food around you, but just kind of reducing the amount of food in your environment in general. Don't remind yourself, don't leave constant reminders around yourself that food is available because your brain takes those cues and all of a sudden you'll be feeling hungry or you'll have a craving. Whereas if you hadn't seen the food, you wouldn't even have thought about it. So um, those two things are important. Physical act regular physical activity is helpful. Um, people who exercise more tend to gain less weight over time. And uh, this is you know, pretty consistent with the evidence that we have from randomized controlled trials in people who carry excess fat. Exercise does cause weight loss. Do we know anything about the type of exercises? Like, is cardio better than weightlifting? Or is there something that we know about the intensity or duration or frequency of exercise that suggests certain type of exercise is better or just exercise is better? You know, honestly, I am probably not the best person to ask that mm. question. There are probably other people who are more knowledgeable about that than I am. I will say that the trials that I've seen that have caused the greatest weight loss um, definitely had a cardio component. Mm. And maybe that's just because those exercises burn more calories mm. um, in total, not per unit time. But generally, if you like go for a jog, you're probably going to burn more calories than if you do strength training. Um, and by the way, I'm not at all you know, <laughs> discounting strength training. I think it's great. Um, but I think the most important thing of all is just to do it. So do it and do it regularly because any type of exercise is beneficial. And I think, um, you know, really the way our ancestors exercised, they didn't call it exercise, right? Exercise, like going out and going for a jog or doing push-ups, that was like the dumbest thing you could possibly do because you were wasting precious energy, right? So like hunter-gatherers, when they don't have something to do, they're hanging out and laying around, taking a nap. They're not going to go for a jog. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They already went on one <laughs> earlier in the day because they had to go get food. Um and so 
our brains aren't really set up to motivate us to do voluntary physical activity. So like going to the gym, going for a jog, etc. These are things that, and I'm not knocking those at all if that's what works for people. Totally cool. That's great. Um, what I'm saying is that a lot of people have trouble sustaining a regular practice of doing that. And so, you know, the way our ancestors got physical activity was it was part of their life, right? It was essential to completing the tasks that they had to complete each day. And so I think it's often helpful for people to build physical activity into their days in a way that's like that. So, for example, commute by bike or commute on foot or run your errands on your bike, run your errands on foot, you know, find ways to build it into your lifestyle. Obviously, that's more difficult for some people than others, depending on where they live. But I think a lot of people, if they use creative thinking, can find some ways to make that happen. There are people like my dad, he, he would never exercise. He's never going to lift a weight. He's never going to go for a jog. But he loves going out and working in his garden or you know, going and clearing the paths in his forest. So, um, you know, those are the types of things that I think kind of work better with how our brain's motivational systems are designed um, in terms of getting us to be sustainable. And so, yeah, and then I think um, sleep is probably relevant. I mean, there's a lot of evidence. There's a ton of observational evidence suggesting that people who sleep um, seven hours or less a night gain weight over time. They gain a lot more weight than people who sleep kind of seven to nine hours. And there are experimental studies that are consistent with that, at least in the short term, that show that sleep restriction increases calorie intake. So I think that managing your sleep so that you're getting as much rest as your body needs is part of the equation. And then there's uh, managing stress as well. So stress probably contributes to weight gain and it contributes to metabolic problems. Also, it just is unpleasant. <laughs> so um, I think that if you can, you know, it doesn't mean having no stress in your life. Some stress can be helpful, but managing stress in such a way that it plays a constructive role in your life and it's not causing you to overeat comfort foods or overeat in general and is not causing you to be in a less favorable metabolic state. So that's kind of, those are kind of some of the topics that I would focus on. And um, those are the ones that I focus on in the last chapter of my book, just for anyone who wants a, a more like complete and concise mm -hmm. discussion of, of those factors. So if we were to just just step back and all these, because there's a lot of different ideas, a lot of different advice that you've you've put across here. If we were to talk about some simple habits that you would recommend someone putting into place if they want to maintain health over their life, um, I know some of the things you talked about were first the the lipostat uh, results in it being um, a lot harder to lose a significant amount of weight and keep it off than it is to stay. Uh, a relatively um, healthy weight most of your life, that uh, it is the case that often it is through our behavior what the food makes us want to consume higher calories, that this is what is driving obesity and overeating rather than the food itself for on a per calorie basis resulting in a lot greater uh, overweight uh, and obesity problems. The other things you talked about were just how in just trying to sort of change your environment. I, I liked how you, you mentioned that a lot of people struggle with making very explicit, dedicated, you know, go and run on a treadmill 30 minutes a day. But if you can make physical activity a, a greater part of your just everyday life, you, you know, you walk more than you drive or you take a bicycle or you do these kinds of things. So if you were to just summarize what you think would be the biggest habits, if you had to just pick, let's say three to five that you think would have the biggest impact, because I know there was a lot of ideas we suggested, but if someone was listening here and they said, you know what, I want to be healthy my whole life. I don't want to deal with this problem later, or maybe I'm a little overweight or I'm overweight now and I don't want to make it worse or want to trend in the right direction. Uh, what would be the habits that you would suggest that you think would have the biggest impact? Yeah, so the number one habit would be to cook your own food using single unrefined ingredients. And 
if you actually try to put that into practice, it's harder than it sounds, and which is a good thing because it'll shine a light. So just, on just it. like give me an idea of what you mean by single unrefined ingredients. Yeah, what would be so an example, um, and a counter example. Yeah, so uh, unrefined ingredients would be things like beans or whole grains, um, and I think you know grinding is fine. So like flour, if it's a whole grain flour, although. Honestly, I'm going to take that back. I think fl- flour foods in general are probably not the best just because they're very easy to make calorie-dense, palatable things out of. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people don't realize bread is actually quite calorie-dense, and then obviously baked goods with sugar and fat added are very calorie-dense. Um, so anyway, so things like uh, beans or how about whole, whole grains, we'll say like you know wheat berries or rye berries, um, eggs, meats, fish, um, milk, yogurt, but um, things like butter or oils or sugar or flowers, particularly white flowers, I think those are the those are the more refined things that you want to limit or eliminate entirely. And you know, honestly, even things like extra virgin olive oil, even though that is um, in some way is probably a healthy food, like for your cardiovascular health. Um, I think that, I mean, that is definitely a refined processed food relative to the whole food, which is the olive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that if you're really focused on preventing fat gain, then you probably should limit added fats, including extra virgin olive oil, just as you would limit added sugars and added you know, white flowers. And so, um, so that's just some examples. Um, and I think, you know, right now the pendulum is swinging toward fat being okay and, and carbs being bad, whereas it used to be that fat was bad and carbs were okay. The truth is that they both contribute to body fatness. There's a lot of evidence supporting this. Um, so if you limit both, if you limit concentrated calorie dense versions of both the fats and the carbohydrates, you're going to be in good shape. So sugar, butter, oil, you know, white flour, would you say white rice in the same category? Uh, or is it yeah. less, less of a problem than, uh, you know, if, if we're going to get into nuance, <laughs> I would say it's probably less of a problem just because mm-hmm. it's more, it's less calorie dense, um, mm-hmm. than bread, for example, rice has more water in it than bread. And so it's less calorie dense. But that said, I mean, I, I still think, you know, if you can do brown rice instead of white right. rice, you're going to be in better shape. So go in that direction. That would be the number one habit of, yeah. of reduce or eliminate these kind of refined products. What would be what would be the next one you would focus on? Regular physical activity. Build it into your life. Okay. Any Any other final ones or do you think if people focus on those two, it would make the big difference? Those are probably the biggest things, but uh, definitely focus on getting restorative sleep and managing stress as well. Um, And controlling your food environment is very important. Okay, well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Guillenay for coming here to discuss this with me, although I think a lot of this advice is things you've heard before. I trust you if you read the book and see how he explores a lot of the behavioral and neuroscientific mechanisms in detail, you'll come away with a much richer understanding of how the brain works and how it influences what we eat and our overall health. Uh, Definitely one of the most interesting books that I've read this year, and I'd like to thank him for coming on and talking to me. Thanks for having me.